Thank you, Merle. Uh, the main thing, uh, every time I listen to my, my background described, it reminds me how old I am. Uh, so, and that's why we need the, the glasses here. Uh, oh, one piece of housekeeping, I was asked to announce who the winner of the competition between the groups. <laughs> The groups was, and uh, it would, turned out to be team number one. So just <laughs> let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> it's just a wonderful surprise to me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to talk about branding and innovation, very much an outsider's perspective. Although the balance of the day and the, the team exercise was was very helpful to get a sense of some of the things that you're wrestling with. And uh, as we went through each of the team solutions, uh, one thought that occurred to me is there'll be some echoes of the things we talked about there in this. Even though that was looking at a kind of an industry-wide set of challenges or a nationwide set of challenges, I'm gonna talk to you more from a single company type perspective. And again, I'm an outsider, so <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is draw on the experiences I've had, the ones I'm having today. Uh, we're in Chairman's Roundtable. We mentor all kinds of businesses. I sit on boards of businesses as diverse as selling online motorcycle parts to a Toyota dealership to a, a major national restaurant company. So uh, these days I find myself looking across lots of different industries and one of the takeaways for me is, yeah, there's a lot of differences but there's also some commonalities and there's some, some safe ways to think, importantly. Not terribly prescriptive but ways and modes of thinking that can be really helpful so that's what I'm gonna to try to share. I'm talk about three basic things in 15 or 20 minutes and then we can talk to whatever extent you'd like to about it. One is a little bit about organization, which is um, I think I see something going on out there which is a good uh, change in paradigm in the way more organizations, I'd like to see more and more organizations operate, which I think produces better results and is more reflective of reality. And then I want to talk a little bit about branding, building a brand position, and can you do that in a, in a business that may be tempted to think of itself as a commodity business? And then just a little bit on innovation, uh, really focused on some of the pitfalls, a couple of the common pitfalls I think that are common, certainly been in my career, in terms of getting yourself to orient toward disruptive change, disruptive innovation, deal with it, okay? So starting on the subject of organization, uh, over 40 years ago, um, I got a quote from someone about that close, maybe a little closer, um, who was actually an Army drill instructor. This is a Marine, but I like the photo. And he explained to me, he explained to me, making clear it wasn't a dialogue, that there were two types of people on the battlefield. George, uh, who are those? <laughs> the, the, the quick and the dead, right? The quick and the dead. Uh, and in the environment we're operating in now and have been in, in, in operating in the last decade or two, I think that's also true for most business organizations. Um, when you're in a period of disruptive change, there's a lot of problems, but for every problem there's usually two or three opportunities. So in this case, we've got one guy trying to avoid becoming a hood ornament on, uh, on the bull, and you've probably got three people selling bandages and liquor <laughs> along the side, you know, making money on, on predictable uh, losers in the race, right? So, uh, you know, first two thoughts, one is uh, the quick and the dead. The second one is that, you know, problems bring opportunities with them. And I think we're in an environment, and I expect us to be in this environment for a while, where the playing field's gonna be tough. Uh, we're working uphill on a, in a lot of ways, but uh, for the quick, uh, that'll become an opportunity. But it helps if you're built for speed. And so you wanna be thinking about your own organization and uh, you know, how agile are we? Uh, 
And when I think about agility, organizationally speaking, what I think about is how lean are we structured? Are we fat in terms of layers? Are we fat in terms of overstaffing and the way we spend money? Uh, how effective are we at sharing the essential information with all ranks in the organization? To what extent do we encourage uh, and support decision making at multiple levels of the organization, not just at the top? Okay, those things really start to become critical if you're trying to be agile as an organization. And I think this is kind of where we're going. I think there's another point. Anybody here read the fifth uh, discipline, Peter Senge, uh, other than George? <laughs> um, that's a 20-year-old book, but it's, it's pretty good. And I've read it probably three times now. And one of the things he talks about in there, which to me goes directly hand in hand with agility is being a learning organization. Uh, there's a colleague of mine at San Diego State who uh, she and I have been working on an article for what seems like 20 years. It's actually only been three. Uh, but we, we were, we're talking, uh, investigating how really good organizations are able to produce effective leadership from front rank employees or so-called mid-level executives. And we thought a good place to go find out some answers to that was to talk to people who have to survive on 23-year-olds being very, very successful uh, at, at acting as effective leaders with very little direction in conditions of great chaos and great danger. We went out and talked to the Marines and the Army and talked to a series of officers from, uh, that had spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan and looking at uh, the things that they did to prepare people to take the initiative and to lead at, at what in business would be considered very junior levels. And we learned a lot of things, but one of the things that I really took away was uh, both services have rule varies by 24 hours uh, between the Marines and the Army, uh, but within 24 to 48 hours of ex executing any significant initiative, you will have an after action meeting and report and you will talk about what you did well, what you didn't do so well, and what you will do differently tomorrow based on that. Um, I don't know about you, I've only done that once in my business career. It was super productive, and as I think back on it, I go, God, you know, what a missed opportunity for learning as an organization. And once you build that into your discipline set, then really as a team, you can move and learn, and you set a set of expectations across the organization, and this is a little bit of a challenge for a lot of businesses, which is, we're not going to jump all over you every time you make a mistake. We expect you to make mistakes in the process of trying to achieve things and in the process of learning. We don't want to see the same mistakes over and over again. But what the military will tell you these days is that uh, they'll really penalize people for not making the call, not for making the wrong one. Expect people to learn. But the, uh, the deciding factor is will you make the call, even if you don't have perfect information. On the part of leadership, that requires giving up a little control. That's a hard thing to do in a lot of businesses. Uh, but that's part of what we took away. So the organizational paradigm that I think is shifting, and I watched it shift during my own working career over four decades, is moving away from the hierarchical command and control structure uh, in some ways because of necessity, because we have taken out a lot of layers in American businesses over the last 30 years as we've downsized. Uh, but finding ways to be more collaborative, to get more involvement, particularly to get those people closest to the customer engaged uh, in setting direction going forward. So that's something I think that's changing and there's some behaviors that come with that that we'll talk about when we get to brand, uh, brand positioning and innovation. Uh, something else that's going on that I think requires us to behave a little differently these days is, uh, and this is a conversation I've been having with a friend of mine who uh, runs an innovation company, of all things, up in San Francisco, very successful. And just he was down for a day about two weeks ago, and we were talking about his term, the new branding. And that is, again, for somebody that's a geezer like myself, was around four decades ago, you could fudge a lot in the 60s in the 70s. You can't do it anymore because uh, there's a conversation going on outside of your control on an ongoing basis online right now. In the restaurant industry, it's, it's called Yelp. You know, people are out there talking to each other about how good or bad you are. 
right? Uh, you can react to it, but you can't control it. Uh, and our conversation was that if anything, this just puts that much more of, of a premium on really building your business on concrete benefits to the consumer and then delivering against them. And to me, that circles right back around in that agile learning organization. Okay, so organization. We want to be agile. We want to be learning. We want to recognize that uh, we cannot control all the things we'd like to control. So that, to me, puts more of a premium on learning. Can commodities or commodity products be successfully branded? I would guess so. All right? If you think about it, 30 years ago, if you said, well, you know, there's going to be this worldwide brand based on selling coffee at ridiculous prices, you'd go, coffee, come on. Coffee is a commodity. We're going to actually be bottling and selling branded water. Yeah, yeah, I see it. You know, no, right? So commodity is a state of mind. Uh, and I would submit that any product that has a reason to exist can develop a brand position. And there are really only two steps I want to talk about in doing that here. And some of this is, uh, you know, things change in business like organizational cultures, but some things stay the same. These, these two principles came out of a 1981 book called Positioning the Battle for Your Mind by a guy named Al Reese who's still out there talking about how brands get positioned. But the first principle he said was, start with what's already in the consumer's head about you. Um, so if you're trying to position yourself, your company, your brand, some specific product line that you've got, you really need to get next to your customer. And by that, I don't just mean talk to them and listen to them. If you can, and I'm doing this for the second time in my life right now, co-develop your product with um, And this, this goes beyond the old paradigm of doing consumer research. Right? This is really living with dialoguing with your customer. I'm working with a startup here in town that's based on mobile technology. Uh, my involvement is based in part on the fact that they're shooting at the restaurant industry as a vertical. And basically what we're doing is we've, we've signed up our first five customers, which are pretty significant restaurant chains, on the premise of we will cut you a deal for X period of time economically in exchange for you working with us as we flesh out what this product capability can do. So they look at it and they get it. In about 20 minutes, they go, hey, I get it. Uh, what do we do to take the next step? But what we're saying is we want to work with you over the next 6 to 12 months because we're not even sure what this can do. Uh, and rather than us invent it and hand it to you and be 30% off target, we'd rather do it together uh, and learn together. Okay? So, you know, got to get next to the consumer, but I see more and more of this kind of thing going on, and I am certainly at this point uh, a huge believer, and I'll be, this is something I'll be seeking to do with, with other brands in the future, and I'm getting real excited about the, the one I'm working on now.